talks together, put together slides, and uh, this is one of those talks where uh, it was co-authored by Graham and myself. Um, if you were at PyCon Australia a few weeks back, you might have seen Graham give this, uh, give this talk there. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it to DjangoCon. Uh, he had to go to Disneyland with his family for a vacation. <laughs> so, boo-hoo for him. Uh, <laughs> So you're welcome to follow along. Uh, the slides are available on Speaker Deck already. Uh, just search for my username, which is Amjit, and you should be able to find that. OK, so we're going to be talking about uh, live debugging of uh, Python web applications. But uh, before that, we need to set the scene, uh, find out why we need to do that. And uh, before we jump into live debugging of, uh, of, a product, uh, of a production system, we also need to collect some data and you know, look at the data in order to know where to look around or where to poke with the actual production system. So we're going to be talking about some of the monitoring tools that already exist right now to collect all the data that you can that will help you out when you do the live debugging. And uh, how are you going to analyze the data that you gather from all these different sources? Um, so those two areas, uh, we'll be looking at a ton of different tools as well as uh, looking at New Relic itself and how is it going to help you with this li live debugging, which we're going to deal with in the later section of the talk. Um, then we'll talk about some of the choices that are available right now uh, for live debugging, and we're going to introduce a new tool called iSpied, which is um, an open source tool written by Graham a few months back, actually, and uh, we're going to do a sort of a pseudo live demo of that tool to, f to you know, actually solve an, uh, a real problem. Okay, so why do we need uh, debugging at all? Let's say you've got an awesome website that's running in production. It's making a lot of money for you. Customers are using it. Um, and you realize that something's, something's going wrong. How are you going to figure out what's, what's going wrong? I mean, it is a live production system, so you can't obviously jump in. And the golden rule is you, know, you, you can't just uh, open up the live production system and start poking around. So how are you going to debug um, where the problem is coming from? Well, some of the problems are quite obvious. I mean, you, whenever there's an error that happens, Python throws a nice exception with a traceback and a stack trace, so you know exactly where the problem comes from. But some of the other issues are more subtle. I mean, if there's a memory leak that's slowly filling up the RAM in your uh, server, you need to find out what's going on. Or if there's data corruption and you're losing user data, I mean, that's an even more uh, worse problem. Or the more elusive ones where the customer says, your, your site's just too damn slow. I mean. Every time I use it, I, I just uh, you know, want to give up or, or want to uh, move to a different competitor or something. So those kinds of issues, how are you going to uh, find out what's causing those issues? Well, some of them are actually easy to kind of reproduce on a development environment or in your staging server. But more often than not, some of the tough to crack ones actually only show up in production. Um, when it actually happens in production, that's when you need live debugging. So as a developer, you would love to just jump right in, you know, start poking around in the live system and find out what's actually going on. But that's when your DevOps team will you know, remind you gently that one does not simply debug in production. And they have a very good reason to say that, because more often than not, when you jump into the live system, and start poking around, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, you are going to cause more trouble than actually any good. So they're just preventing you from you know, causing more trouble. So there are some obvious things we need to avoid. If you are, in fact, going to start poking around in a, in a live system or in a production system, you have to make sure that uh, you're not causing more damage than good. <clears throat> you obviously don't want to crash the whole website or you don't want to lose your customer data or expose the data from the customer to the whole world, which is even worse, um, you know, this is obviously going to get you fired. Or worse, you're going to end up in the daily WTF, because some reputations are forever. Trust me. <laughs> so how are, we going to, uh, how are we going to control that? Well, it's all about managing risk. If you can use a live debugger that can control your actions, um, which, which lets you predict what is going to happen, meaning you understand the consequences before you go and do something in your live uh, debugging system. That's how you manage your risk. Obviously, you don't want to lose Canon, who's causing more trouble. But at the same time, you don't want to restrict yourself from doing certain actions with a, a certain level of risk. And the way to do that is, if you are, in fact, going to make changes, script those changes and test them out in a staging environment before you go and start changing the, uh, the actual um, system itself. Before we actually know where to change the things, we need to look at the data. And that's where the monitoring comes in. So let's start with the most benign thing that you can do to your system to collect data, which is passive monitoring. 
Um, what I mean by that is you build in you know, mechanisms already in place which would be collecting data on a continual basis, and in the event of a problem, you'll have enough data to do some kind of forensic analysis and find out you know, where to, what went wrong or, or where are you uh, supposed to be looking at. And this can be as simple as collecting log files from different sources, or it can be uh, you know, storing error exception that happens uh, on your web application, or this could be performance data that you're collecting from multiple different sources, like your web servers, or your web application, or your database, and so on. So let's, let's tackle one at a time. So we've got log file collection. Log files can actually come from a ton of different sources. Your operating system is going to throw a log file. Your database has a log file. Web servers have log files. Web application has log files. And if you've got you know, external web, web services that you're using, like say, for example, you're using a, a, an API from Facebook or Dropbox or uh, something similar, that's going to ha that might also have its own log file. So these log files are actually strewn all over the system. And being able to kind of correlate the information from different sources and be able to find out the information that you need, it's kind of hard. But there are tools that exist to make it easier. Um, there are both open source and commercial tools that are available. Um, you can think of these tools as um, search engines for your log files, where if you are trying to find out what exactly happened at this given instant in different sets of log files, these will help you narrow those things down and be able to correlate them um, quite quickly. And the information that is in the log file can be very, very valuable if your system actually logs something into the log file when you know, something goes wrong. The reason I say this is because more often than not, web frameworks, whenever there is a Python exception happens, web frameworks will swallow that Python exception and output a nice HTTP 500 error for you. Because you obviously don't want to store that, uh, show that stack trace to the user. But this also means that you're not, you're not logging those exceptions somewhere so that you can go look at it. Because these exceptions will actually have the traceback um, of which function is actually causing that exception. Um, so there are some external tools that will help you do this uh, where they, anytime an exception happens, it'll intercept that exception, and it'll store that exception for later use and still you know, continue your application to throw the 500 error for the user to see. And um, when, it comes to the, when it comes to server monitoring, that's a completely different beast. So here's where you're collecting the health statistics about your server, which could be anything like you know, CPU usage, um, I.O., memory usage, or your disk use, um, availability, and so on. And here again, we got a, a ton of different uh, tools that are available, both open source as well as commercial. Uh, New Relic provides a free service which does the same things that most of these tools do. And some of these tools actually, you can configure them. They're extremely and very, very highly configurable. Um, you, so, you know, shop around and find out what works best for you. If you. So, the next layer of monitoring is monitoring your Python web application itself. This is where you're trying to find out, you know, which functions in your Python web application is causing the most time, or it's taking the most time, um, you know, causing a bottleneck for your, uh, for your performance. And New Relic is definitely your friend in this area because, in addition to providing the server monitoring, um, we provide breakdown of what functions are taking how, how much longer, and a trace back of what is the uh, what's the flow when a particular slow transaction happens. Um, and also, it gives you a breakdown of when you have a real user who's you know, loading your website, how long did it take for him to actually load the website? And where is the user coming from geographically? And uh, you, know, you can correlate all the, all the different um, layers uh, of, of a particular request. So obviously, you can bring together a multitude of these tools and collect all the data that you can about your system. But the real question is, what value is this data when you're trying to debug an issue? How are you going to find out from this data what went wrong? Or if something says that this is going wrong, how are you going to fix that issue? So let's say, um, let's say that your uh, monitoring system is saying that your Python application is able to produce the data at a, at a reasonable speed, but the bottleneck is, in fact, coming from <clears throat> It's actually coming from the page loading. The, the, the page loading is taking longer than the normal time, and you're trying to figure out where exactly is the problem happening. There are some online services that will give you a breakdown of exactly how much time each DOM element took to load, so you can find out which is your, um, your, your worst offender right there. But um, you obviously I mean, have to keep in mind that these are not working from the perspective of a real user. 
because this is in relation to where the online services are located, or in the case of a browser plugin, where the browser is located in relation to where, the, uh, where your web servers are. When you get to the application performance analysis, um, sorry about the font, I didn't realize it was that bad. Um, New Relic will give you a breakdown of the different view handlers and how much time was taken by each of the view handlers. And it gives you a throughput and the response time of each of these view handlers. And every single minute, it'll collect sample data about uh, the slowest transaction that happened on that minute, and it'll give you more uh, in-depth analysis on those. On those. Um, here's a, a quick screenshot. Um, I'm really sorry about the quality, but uh, here's a quick screenshot of the slow transaction summary where it gives you a nice breakdown of whether the time uh, is coming from the Python code that is getting executed, or it's coming from the database, or whether it's coming from an external service, and all the different, uh, all the different fields here. If you want to drill down even further, you can, uh, you can get more context where it gives you a waterfall diagram of which functions were called in what order. And, but you also have to keep in mind that this is not every single function in your web application because we don't uh, we, we want to limit the amount of overhead that uh, the monitoring can you know can induce in 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 your application's performance so we deem certain functions as being interesting functions so for example in databases we we only monitor the connect and the commit and uh, the the different functions so it it gives you an idea of uh, or it, it gives you an overall picture of where in the piece of code the most time is being spent. But occasionally, you can end up in a scenario where you'll have 30% of the time being spent in application code. I mean, that's where we have absolutely no idea that we should be monitoring that piece of code, because this is a custom function that you wrote. So in scenarios like that, you can actually provide a little bit of hint for the monitoring tool that can you know, start tracking specific functions. Um, in our case, we do, uh, we do provide with an API where you wrap a function of your interest, you tag them with a decorator, and then we will start tracking those functions as well um, in addition to the ones that we already do. Um, you might be wondering, I mean, you don't want to be modifying your existing source code because it's kind of intrusive to do this kind of uh, uh, modification in your actual source code, or if you're using a third-party module, you really don't want to be messing with their um, source as well. In that case, you could specify the functions of interest in your, um, in your config file, where you just basically list the functions that you want to additionally monitor, and uh, we will automatically start uh, tracing those functions as well. Now, let's say you have a, um, a, a data store that you're using in your system that no one has heard of. I mean, there's absolutely no, you know, uh, no prior experience with, uh, with anyone else. Um, in that scenario, you might want to actually go a little bit further and monkey patch your own modules. Whenever those modules get imported, you might want to wrap your functions and grab all the input parameters that are going to a different function. That's, that's, where, that's also actually possible, where in your config file you say, you know, this is my import hook. Whenever this module gets imported, call this, um, uh, call this file, and that file will have a function that will go and monkey patch your function on the fly. So this is a very powerful feature where you can, addition, you can add additional instrumentations on packages and modules that don't even exist anywhere else. So those are some advanced ones. But they, you, you kind of have to keep in mind that any t this, these are not really live debugging or live changes to your monitoring. The reason is because any time you modify the configuration file, you're having to restart your application in order for these changes to take effect. What we're looking for is more along the lines of, you know, how do you change these things on the fly? And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, before we jump into that, I want to talk, uh, talk about the actual profilers that come with the Python uh, standard module itself. There is a C profile module that comes um, in the standard, uh, standard package, which it can add quite a bit of overhead when you run it, but it gives you the fullest picture. This is the one which tells you Every, which actually captures every single function that gets called and then how much time was spent and how many times they get called for a specific uh, request or a specific uh, run. But it adds a lot of overhead, um, so it's not really good for using it in production. So a, a better compromise would be to use some kind of a sampling profiler. A sampling profiler is the one where it takes a snapshot of uh, all the threads that are running currently and then collects the, the stack trace from all the threads. and then. When it does this at, at regular intervals for a, over a period of time, you get an idea of which function gets called frequently or which function 
is always getting the contention or you know have been running for a very long time. So it helps you identify those hot functions before you can start adding instrumentations for them. Um, I think Dropbox released their, um, their sample profiler called Plop recently, which has a nice uh, visualization tool built on D3. Um, and there's actually another one in Python package index called StatProf. What this does is it not only gives you which function is your hot function, this will give you line level detail. Uh, where it'll tell you which line inside that function was the one that get ca uh, got called like most number of times, or uh, you're spending more time on that particular line. So that's that goes quite a um, quite in depth actually. And obviously, New Relic is by no means the only instrumentation uh, tool out there. There are other sources where you know you can use Graphite and collect information from this and display it using that. Uh, but I think. Arguably, the New Relic gives you the most value out of the box, right out of the box, and um, gives you, you know, actionable data that you can immediately act upon and, and uh, find and, and fix your issues. So let's move on to the actual live debugging where we are actually prodding the live application that's actually running right now. Um, there are some solutions that exist right now, um, like the Paste Debugger, the Flask Debugger, but these are more suited for a, a development environment because the output that comes back from these debuggers, they are displayed in a browser from which the request was made. So obviously you can be using this in production, but you can still use them in a, uh, a staging environment or in a development environment and you know, set your, uh, run your web application in the debug mode to get these, uh, these debuggers. So if we are going to do this in um, production, that's when we talk about the dark art of live debugging. What I mean by that uh, live debugging is building backdoors into your application. And this is actually not a new concept because Python's standard logging module actually has a backdoor where if you, um, if you set it up in such a way, it'll actually start listening to a socket continuously and you can send a configuration, a new configuration to the socket and it'll apply that on the fly and without having to you know, restart that uh, application and it'll start to take effect right away. Um, but you have to take caution how you implement these because um, even the logging module, it actually runs eval on parts of your configuration file. So if you want, um, or if you're notorious, you can actually you know, send some malicious code and have it eval and take over the system using the logging module. Um, so that's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> but uh, another one that you could do is actually embed a Python interpreter to the live running process and there are some projects out there that do that, which uh, an example, a great example is Twisted uh, Manhole, which does this. Um, but here you don't get the control that you would get. Um, you know, if you are in fact going to be doing this in production, you need to do this in a very controlled manner where the, where the actions are scripted or the actions that you're about to do know what you're, you know, you, you know the consequences of them before you actually do them. Whereas these interpreters give you the, the, the full power. I mean, they, you, can, you can modify anything on the fly, and it's, it can get quite dangerous. Or there's an even scarier concept where you use Pyrocyte, which uses GDB to inject some code into your running live Python application in memory, um, which goes even a step further in my, in my view. So the solution is um, we're going to introduce a new tool called iSpide which is a new framework that Graham's been working on for a while. Um, he used to call this uh, Whiskey Shell because he was trying to help you know, Whiskey users debug the issues with, uh, with mod WSGI applications and things like that. Uh, but it can actually be used for any kind of you know, long running Python processes. It doesn't have to be a Whiskey application. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why this is different and uh, how you could use this in production. So, Again, this requires your application to have a backdoor, which, you know, in this case, it will your application will be listening to a socket, um, you know, either a Unix socket or an inet uh, socket, and you'll have a client called iSpy, which would connect to that socket, and then it'll put you in a uh, in a command line interface where only certain commands are available for you. And this is driven by the Python's uh, standard command module. Um, if you guys have used it, uh, you already know how to do the, uh, you know, build your own little command line interfaces. Um, the way this is different is because 
you can, this is, uh, this is an extensible plugin driven uh, framework. And what happens here is you can enable and disable certain plugins on certain machines. So you can choose to enable the more powerful one in your staging and development environment, whereas in production, you can only enable the ones that you know are not going to you know, uh, cause disastrous effects. So uh, time for a quick demo. Since I am too much of a, let me see. OK, so this is a small, uh, small flask app that uh, I wrote for this presentation. And all it does is it's a little, um, little calculator type thing, where you know, if you add two things, or if you, if you, can, you can call sum, or yeah, product, or the nasty one in this case is call the Fibonacci of a, of, of a particular number. Now, you might be wondering, I mean, this is an easy problem, because if you call a Fibonacci of a 100, obviously that's going to overwhelm the Python's uh, um, stack, and, and that's going to cause a problem, but we're going to restrict that. We're only going to allow Fibonacci can be computed only up to 30 numbers or something. And there can still be an issue with this particular uh, simple web app, and I'm going to show you how we're going to deal with that. Since I'm a too much of a wimp to actually do a live demo, I recorded uh, recorded a pseudo live demo. So in this case, iSpy is the client that we're using, and iSpy.ini is the configuration file where I've enabled all the different plugins, actually, in this case, because um, you, know, you can't really show off without enabling all the plugins. So, I go into the, so I, once I launch iSpy, it puts me in a command line mode, and it gives me all the commands that are available for me to use. When I do the servers, it shows me what are the servers that are currently running. And these are the different applications, the backdoors that you've already built. So anything that is listening to that socket, iSpy is going to um, list them for you. And now I'm, I'm connected to that, and if, when I run help now, since the context has changed, obviously the commands have also changed with them. So shell is used to launch a particular plugin, and you can uh, start playing with them. So let's look at a couple of the plugins that we have available now. Is that still visible to everyone? OK. Um, so we've got, we've got a, a, a couple of uh, plugins that are enabled here. So I'm just going to look at the Python plugin right now. And when I launch the Python plugin, the commands that are available under that plugin automatically changes because that, those are the commands that are uh, enabled inside that, inside that plugin. Um, the most benign one is you know, if you've launched your application using a command line uh, with you know, multiple different command line switches, you could just you know, look at what, how was it launched. This can be kind of useful if, you, if your process has been running for a while and you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have enough threads. You are trying to figure out how many threads are we running did we start this with, or do, how many processes did I start this with? Um, that'll kind of give you an idea. In this case, it's very uninteresting because we didn't start with anything else. If you want, you can look at the environment variables that, uh, that were there when you launched that application, which can be interesting. Um, Let me look at a different one. So if you have multiple threads that are running, threads is a command that will give you um, a little stack trace of different threads that are running. So in this case, if you have a particular thread that's kind of locked up for a very long time and you were trying to figure out where, where is this stuck, what am I trying to, what is it trying to uh, compute at that situation, then the threads will actually give you an idea of what threads are running and, and what is the stack trace for each thread. Um, let's look at a different plugin here. So, Whiskey plugin. This is the one where um, you know if you are running a Whiskey application, it comes in quite handy um, because if you've got multiple requests that are running currently, um, and you're trying to figure out you know what are the different requests that are running and which one is the one that's actually kind of stuck that's causing the other requests to get dropped, um, you can run requests. Right now, I don't have any uh, transactions, but if I try it again, I see that there is a transaction that was um, triggered. And if I go up, so you'll, you'll notice that we have the stack trace here. And on top of that, 
once I scroll all the way up, I can see the HTTP header which triggered that particular request. So I get the actual URL um, that was used to launch that particular request. Okay, um, nothing more interesting on Whiskey, but if, so, debugger. This is a very powerful plugin that can or cannot be enabled in, the, in production. It's, it's really up to how much risk you're willing to take. Let's say with that application, you've got some kind of monitoring that is running. Um, let's say you've, you've deployed New Relic and it's, it's running in production, and every now and then you're getting a, a HTTP 500 error. And New Relic is telling you that, you know, the, from the stack trace, you're able to find out that the exception was you've blown out of the, the stack because, you know, you've reached the recursion depth and so on. And you're trying to figure out, because you've already limited the number of times the Fibonacci can be called, you're trying to wonder, like, wh how can we even reach that kind of a, um, you know, a recursion depth? So that's where the debugger is going to help us. What we're going to do with debugger is um, we're going to insert probes into different functions. And any time that one of those functions actually trigger an exception, the, the probe will capture the traceback for that exception. And you can actually go in and debug that particular exception, do a postmortem analysis on it, try to find out you know, what are the local variables at that time, global variables, and find out how that exception was actually triggered. So we're, we're actually going to do that now. So I'm going to insert a probe at Fibonacci. And just to be safe, I'm adding a couple more, one at the addition and the pro product one. So when I list them, I mean, I get all the, um, all the probes that are currently uh, enabled. And when I look at the tracebacks, it tells me if an exception was thrown and it got captured there. Right now, we don't have anything, but you know, you go for a cup of coffee or something, come back after 30 minutes, and you find yourself an exception because an, a user has triggered it. So let's examine what's inside that traceback. If you just do print on that traceback, it gives you a, a stack trace again. But we already know that Fibonacci is the one that's running out of uh, the stack trace or the recursion depth, and this doesn't really get us too much information here. So what we're going to do is attach the Python debugger to this traceback, trace back, and uh, we're going to examine the, uh, examine the environment there. So now this puts us into the PDB. You know, just to get my bearings, I'm, I'm running a list to look at where in the source code I am right now. I see myself in the iSpy uh, source code, so go one level up, and now I'm in the Fibonacci um, function itself. Now, let's look at what are the different uh, local variables that are available. I got uh, variable number n, or variable named n, and when I print that, it's a negative number. And there's our answer, because some user was trying to find out what's the Fibonacci for a negative number, which we did not anticipate. And in this case, we were actually able to find out because we did a postmortem analysis on the actual uh, traceback that, that came through. So that, and you know, you, you've got all the other uh, regular uh, PDB commands available for you. So you can do, you know, look at all the local variables or look at all the global variables that are available and uh, poke around even more and find out what went wrong. So that's how live debugging can be useful for you. And I, let me see. OK. So I hope that gave you an idea. So these are the different commands that, uh, are, also available, that are also available on the slides and, and little screenshots from them. Um, I hope that gives you an idea of what it is capable of right now. But the real power comes from its extensibility. I mean, one could potentially write a, um, a new plugin for New Relic where uh, we talked about how you could monkey patch a, your own different module, but you you only realize you know after you've started your application that you needed more information from it. You could actually go and do the monkey patching on the fly without having to restart your application. So um, this is potentially possible, but we don't have it right now. And creating plugins, if you already know how to use the command module, you already know how to create plugins. If you don't, it's as simple as creating a class with a bunch of methods. And any of the methods that start with the name do, that is the command that's available under that plugin. And that's really that simple. And since we're dealing with a command line interface, anything you print to the STD out is going to be available um, under the command line whenever that uh, command gets executed. So it's, it's a very easy to extend uh, framework. And the idea that we have for this is hopefully people will think of this as a framework that can be built upon where you, know, you build your third party plugins and put, it, put them up on PyPy, and people can download them and you know, run them in their development environment, or if they find it useful, they can run it in the production environment and so on. And one of the great examples for a third-party plugin would be 
uh, tracking how many memory objects get uh, created during the process, this, which can lead to you know, finding out where the memory leak's coming from. Um, this is a fairly new project. I mean, uh, the, the architecture might change, but you know, um, this is the time to get involved if you're, um, if you're interested in that at all. So in conclusion, what I'm trying to say is if you are, if you are running a production system, use some level of, um, use some level of monitoring. And a single tool is not the answer. You have to use complementary tools to get the full picture. And feel free to build in deeper mechanisms so that you can debug when things go wrong and, and learn how to do them in a controlled manner so you don't have to treat these production systems as the special sanctums that only you know, anointed uh, operations people can actually touch. So obviously, we hope that you would consider New Relic as part of your um, tool set. And whatever you do, use some level of monitoring. And if you have no monitoring at all, then it means when a problem occurs, you have no idea where things are going wrong. So become a data nerd and deploy New Relic today. If you're interested in iSpide or if you have comments, suggestions, um, or general hate mail, you know, um, send it to Graham Dumpleton, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So we've actually been using New Relic in production, and it's been fantastic. Um, a question that's come up is, you know, what's the cost of that? And obviously, I think the, the gain that you get outweighs the cost. But is there a way to measure? Because all these things that instrument your functions and everything, there's a cost to it, right? Is there a way to measure? Do you have some figures into what's the cost of actually getting those, that data? That's, that's a very interesting question. And uh, so, so, well, let me first give you the internal goal that we have. So internally, we want to keep the overhead for monitoring under 5%. So that's our internal goal, and we are constantly striving for that. And before we release anything, we do run them through performance tests where we check to make sure, you know, without the, um, you know, with, without, without New Relic, I run this application and put it under load for 24 hours. How much memory did it take? How much CPU does it take? And then we put New Relic on top, and then we find out, you know, how it has changed. What is the response times and so on? And we are, in fact, reaching that goal of 5%. But again, I have to remind you that it, it's very, very application specific. Because if you are, if you have just an API, you know, a REST API kind of a server, and your response times are under two milliseconds, I mean, you're going to see an overhead of two milliseconds. So that's like 100% overhead. Whereas if a normal, I mean, any normal web response these days, I mean, it takes at least, up, I mean, up to the page rendering, it takes up to like five, five seconds or six seconds. Um, you know, the, the two milliseconds or the five milliseconds overhead that you're going to see is, is going to get completely drowned out. The best way for you to, to measure that would be to you know, disable New Relic, run them, run the server monitoring, and find out all the data that you get out of the server monitor. And you know, enable New Relic, run the server monitoring again, and find out for yourself. Uh, that would be the best answer that I have right now. OK. All right. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Um...